Thanks for tuning in to the Oasis Church. The Oasis Church exists to glorify God through the making of disciples and the preaching of God's Word. If you'd like to learn more about the Oasis Church, visit us online at www.theoasischurch.net. When I was 23, I remember a specific and special trip to the Grand Canyon. Uh, The Grand Canyon, gorgeous, beautiful, magnificent creation of God, by God, for God's glory. And man, we live in a really, really unique and cool state here being in Arizona because you can travel about three hours north and go from the desert to not the desert. And so it is this big variety. I don't know what they call that, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's a big variety of forests and all that is in the north. And I love the Grand Canyon. I think it's a gorgeous place. There are some of you that are cynics in this room and we're praying for your sanctification that will look at the Grand Canyon and say it's a big hole in the ground. Hey, praying for you. Love you. Praying for you, right, this morning. And it is magnificent. Uh, For those of you that have lived under a rock for your whole life, every single state in the United States has a nickname. And we are the Grand Canyon. Canyon State. It is one of the wonders of the world. Over 5 million people a year go to visit. Right around 40,000 of those 5 million are nuts enough to hike it. Again, way too much effort for me. Uh, I'll sit at the top and enjoy it. Uh, You know what I mean? So I remember this one trip, 23 years old, And I'd seen the Grand Canyon many times. I was born and raised in uh, Phoenix, so I've seen the Grand Canyon before. And I remember I was 23. I was living in Houston. I came back to visit mom and dad, and they said, let's go to the Grand Canyon. And so I said, okay. And so we went. And if you've you've never been there, you walk from the parking lot, and then you get to the rail overlooking the Grand Canyon, and your breath is taken away. And you sit in amazement. And I remember standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon just looking. And it's just like the movies, you know what I mean? Where people are talking, but you don't hear them. Total silence. And it was a magnificent moment. And I noticed in my peripheral vision that two ladies came up. They're middle-aged, probably, you know, middle-aged, whatever that is. And (laughs) came here and here. Uh, Yeah, I don't want to go there. Um, Not going to guess. I'm going to try not to get in trouble. Uh, and so came in one lady to my right and a lady to her right, and they're clearly um, friends or family or whatever. I mean, I'm just taking it in. And I'm soaking it in, and I'm going, man, this is so awesome. And I'm praying or whatever. And then I hear this. <sighs> oh. And I'm like, what is happening? You know, but you're like, you know what? This is between me and God. And I hear it again. Hmm. And the lady not to my right, but the lady to her right says this. She says, can we just take the picture and move on? Can we just take the picture and move on? If you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them. Turn with me to Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. Why do I tell you that story as we're looking at Hosea? Because this morning we're going to walk through what is the gospel. And I think so often in our minds when we talk about the gospel, we kind of give this idea, been there, done that. Can we take the picture and move on? And man, I want to talk to you. If that is you this morning, wake up. Because man, this morning is for you. The gospel is not something where we've been there, done that, take our picture, move on into something greater, something more than the gospel. The gospel is where we start, it's where we continue, and it's where we finish in our Christian life. Amen. Good. Got one of us there. All right. So, so the gospel is the central theme, the main theme of the church. It is what we unapologetically declare day in and day out in our Christian lives. That you and I, unworthy of anything good, unworthy of anything right, have received salvation from the Lord. And so we're going to look at the book of Hosea this morning. Hosea is the first of the minor prophets. Why? What is a minor prophet? 
Minor simply defines less text devoted to them. Your major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Daniel's kind of one of those major unique prophets. And then Hosea is your first of the minor prophets. What minor does not mean is authority. So we believe that the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, every single dot, tittle, and word is the authoritative word of God. So the red letters of John 8, 58, where Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, that does not have more authority than Hosea chapter 1. And if I put that authority above it, you're violating what Jesus himself said, because guess what he did? He always said, have you not read in the law and in the prophets? It is the whole Bible is God's word to man. And if you are joining us, if you're new to the Oasis, we read through the Bible five chapters a week. And we just got through the first five chapters of Hosea. And we're going to continue on. If you don't have that schedule, it's on our website. It's on the back. It is what we hold on to because we believe as a church that we need to hold on to the word of God and never let go. Amen. Good. All right. So we're still waking up. Good. So that is what we believe here this morning. The Bible is infallible. It is without error. It is God's revelation of himself to us. And here is the good news. It is not about us. It is about God and God and God alone. It's all about God. Guess what, y'all? Here you go. In your own life, you are not the hero of your story. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? You are not the hero in your own story. And the moment you think you are is the moment you need to go back to the Grand Canyon and put away the picture you had and realize how tiny and small a little grain of sand on the sea you are in the grand scheme of God's redemptive plan. Next, you might be in here this morning and you might be like, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in his word, and I want to argue with you. Wonderful. You are still part of God's redemptive plan. You refusing to believe in God does not detract God's glory. C.S. Lewis, we're going to throw it up on the screen, said this, quote, a man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribbling the word darkness on the walls of his cell. Let me say that again. A man can no more diminish God's glory by refusing to worship him than a lunatic can put out the sun by scribing the word darkness on the walls of his cell. Even if you don't believe in God and die, you will bow down. You will bow before the king. But we're going to look this morning at how far God's willing to go to save a messed up sinner like you and like me this morning. And we're going to see that in Hosea. Because the Bible has stood the test of time. It is the, Bi- it is the Bible and the Bible alone that treasures through history that is where the church grows in and from is through the reading of God's word. And I want to share with you this morning If you have been a member of this church and you have gotten a little slack in our reading plan, join us back. Don't miss the amazing blessing God is pouring through, through his word to your heart this morning. Be honest with yourself and say, man, I need to get into this word and allow God to transform me. So we're going to look at Hosea chapter 1 and 3. But before we do that, we've got to do something really important. We've got to pray. We got to come before the Lord, enter his presence. And I want to invite you, if you're able, would you join me on your knees? Why do we do this? We do this because this is where we should always be before the Almighty King. So would you join me on your knees as we go before the Lord in prayer this morning? Father God. It was by your word and your breath that you put the stars and the galaxies in in the sky. God, when I think about how big the universe is, I just feel so small and recognize how big you are. God, you are great. God, you are worthy of praise. 
And God, that's what we are doing here this morning, God. We are coming before you in praise and adoration. God, as we are going to look at your word, God, I pray that you'll illuminate both our mind and our hearts this morning so we can see you more clearly. Now, church, I ask that you pray for me. Pray I'll be helpful to you. Pray that God will fan into flame his message this morning. Pray mostly that I will decrease so that he may increase this morning. Now, church, I ask that you pray for yourself. Pray that God will speak to you. Pray that he will soften your hard heart. And pray that he'll reveal himself in a mighty way through his scripture this morning. Lord, we love you and we lift these prayers up to you. We pray these things because of your son through the spirit. Amen. You can have a seat. So the best thing I can do for you and for me this morning is I've got to put us into a context in where Hosea is preaching and doing his ministry from. If you rewind back into the formation of the Jews in Exodus, there were 12 tribes of Israel. Everyone belonged to one of the 12 tribes of Israel. You get to David in First and Second Samuel, and what does David do? He takes all 12 tribes, he unites them into one kingdom. It's one kingdom and one kingdom alone. Then David is promised by God that there will be a heir from his throne who will take the, take the throne and he will rule over the nations. And then he has Solomon. And Solomon asks for wisdom, does really well at the beginning, and then he fumbles at about the 20-yard line and fumbles bad. He wants to gain power. He wants to gain money. So he does a whole bunch of horrific things like marrying a whole bunch of women in order to gain favor from other countries. And guess what it did? It made Israel filthy rich. I mean, they were filthy rich. But then you can't have enough riches if that is your God. And so he has to have more. So what does he do is Solomon then takes his own people and makes them slaves in the land. And so First and Second Kings is going to draw this out to you that Solomon, the king of Israel, is just as bad to his own people as Pharaoh was in Exodus to the Jews. He has then a son, and his son comes to power, Rehoboam. Rehoboam comes to power, and guess what he does? He puts Solomon's plan into overdrive. He becomes worse than Solomon. And First and Second Kings is going to show you, man, Solomon was horrific. And then his son, Rehoboam, becomes even worse. Well, then people from the north rebelled, and the country was split in two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And so the book of First and Second Kings, which was one book when it was originally written, when the book of First and Second Kings talks about the 20 kings in the north and the 20 kings in the south. And so they evaluate the 40 kings, and guess how many of those kings did well? Eight. And they were all in the southern kingdom. Hosea comes on to the scene, and he is a prophet to the northern kingdom. He is a prophet to the northern kingdom, the messed up kingdom. And so let's look at verse 2. So that's basically what verse 1 is telling you, by the way, um, in case you all are wondering, why did he tell us that? I was just summarizing verse 1 for you. So here we go, verse 2. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, go take to yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking the Lord. The word of the Lord comes to Hosea, and it's not, hey, how are you? Hey, how's life going? Hey, let me sit down with you. Let's have a cup of coffee together. His first word to Hosea is go, go. And what are you to do? You are to marry a prostitute. So I want to put this into perspective for y'all. I'm going to talk about singleness for just a moment. I'm defining singleness as not married. There is not a single person who is a single on this planet who's like, man, I really hope God calls me to marry a prostitute. That's not what they're thinking here. No one is dreaming of their wedding day going, 
man, I hope when she walks down that aisle, she'll just have come out of prostitution. This is a very bleak command. This is a very rough command. I also want us to notice God calls his people into action. The life of the Christian is not sedentary. It's not sat being still. The life of the Christian is getting off of the couch, getting off of the bench, and getting into the game. It is impossible to read the Bible in a true understanding and illumination by the Holy Spirit and not be moved into action. And so, we see God calling his prophet into action. And what we next see is the understanding of God is going to use Hosea as an example for the rest of Israel. So here's what you, we need to understand about Hosea. If you miss this part of Hosea, you will not understand the rest of the book. There is no such thing as spiritual singleness. What do I mean by that? There is no such thing as you not worshiping something. The person who does not worship anything is truly worshiping something. They just don't want to admit it. Most likely, they're worshiping themselves. They're depending on themselves for illumination. They're depending on themselves for truth. They're depending on themselves for status. They're depending on themselves for a whole bunch of stuff. And they're worshiping themselves. They're married to themselves in worship. This is idol. Idols are a big deal in our culture. Idols are anything we look to to give us what only God can truly give us. And let me tell you, church, let me tell you, because I love you this morning. Please listen to me. If you don't think you have an idol problem, you have one. I have one. And man, it's not them out there who has struggles with idols. It's not them out there who's violating the word of God. Man, we are all guilty of this. There's no such person that stands before God and goes, yeah, I'm good with God on my own. That person does not exist as declared to us by the word of God. Because what is good? Good in God's language is perfect and no one is perfect. Amen? Amen. So we need to understand that's what God's getting at. He's getting at your heart and my heart that if you think you're good enough, you're not. And so here's what happens. You're going to go marry for yourself a prostitute. And this is offensive. Even in a culture like ours, who has such a low view of marriage, even the worst of atheists would agree this does not sound like an exciting time. Why? Because, man, even in a culture with such a low view of marriage, we find cheating on a spouse despicable and disgusting. And God is declaring to you and to me, we are guilty of this in our relationship with him. Verse 3a says this. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Deblame. So notice something really important here. Hosea is commanded and Hosea is obedient. Notice how Hosea is sent and Hosea goes. You're going to see this in contrast if you read the book of jo Jonah. Ho Jonah is sent and Jonah doesn't go. Doesn't end up well for Jonah. Hosea is sent and Hosea goes. So where does he go? He goes to that part of town you all are familiar with, that part that no one talks about, that part of town no respectable man, no priestly man as Hosea was. No priest, no pastor would ever go to that part of town. It's where people hide their identity when they walk through. It's where people are like, no, I, I've never been there. And so he marries her. Can you imagine that rehearsal dinner meeting the parents? So, Gomer, what do you do? Um, a prostitute. Oh, can you imagine how awkward that must have been? As he met with his groomsmen, and his groomsmen are like, bro, this is not a good idea. This is going to end badly for you. Can you imagine all the council of the church people? Uh, pastor, you're doing what? 
man, I'm not comfortable with this. Yet he's following God. And wouldn't you rather say, man, I followed God than I followed the opinions of others? This is a pastor, y'all. He's marrying a woman of prostitution. And so we're going to look about at 3B, and we're going to jump around some verses because I want to make sure I've got a lot of material covered. But I want you to make sure you understand the context of chapter 1. So 3B says this, And she conceived and bore him a son. And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel, for just in a little while I'll punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I'll put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. If you're a highlighter or note taker or underliner, underline, bore him. Probably the most important phrase in this passage. Now jump down to verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name No Mercy. Some of your uh, translations may say Lo Ruama. That's the actual Hebrew for you. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them all. Now jump down to verse 8 and 9. When she had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, call his name, not my people. Again, some of your translations say, lo ami. For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Do you all see the progression that is happening? First child, she bore him a son. That first child definitely belongs to Hosea. The next child, what is missing? Bore him a son. So Hosea is writing this. He's recounting to you what has happened and what is missing is bore him a son. Translation, he doesn't know if that kid is his or not. Then the third child, lo ami. I definitely know this child does not belong to me. Names are very important in the Old Testament. Every name has a purpose. Next, do we also notice something very important about chapter 1 here? That Hosea is an example to Israel of who they are. God is using Hosea as a teaching tool to the people of Israel. So here's the deal. Hosea is suffering for the sins of others. How, how do I know that? What do I mean by that? How, why is that comforting this morning? Because it's going to point us to a greater one who will suffer for the sins of others. It's going to point us to a greater one who's going to be punished for the sins of others. But even beyond that, think about what Hosea is walking through. First child comes definitely his. Next child comes, not sure if it his. Third child comes, definitely not his. So picture the scene. Hosea come, or excuse me, Gomer comes in late at night, and Hosea doesn't have to ask her, where have you been? Because he knows the answer. She's been with another man. Think about it. He's taking care of kids, and she's nowhere around. Think about it. The woman he's supposed to love, and she is loving others. No spouse would ever find this a joyous occasion. Being a prophet, being called by God, being obedient to God, let me tell you, because I love you this morning, I want to tell you what the text says. I want, it, I want you to hear this. Being obedient to God can end badly for your life. Don't believe me. Okay, Moses, the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, those are not my words, those are Deuteronomy's words, traveled the desert for 40 years where all the people did was complain and complain and complain. Anyone want to sign up for that job this morning? And man, he gets to the promised land, gets literally to that point, and God says, yeah, you're going to go up on the mountain and die. Greatest prophet, y'all. John the Baptist, the greatest man to ever live. Jesus' words, not mine. He is thrown into prison for faithfully preaching and teaching God's word where he is then beheaded and killed for following God. Being obedient to God does not dissuade suffering. But being obedient to God makes suffering that every single person 
in life will experience makes it totally worth it. Because you have a future hope, and that hope is not in this life. So let me tell you this morning, here's the application. Listen to me this morning. If you are in here and you are suffering, you're going through a moment where you're like, God, I can't take any more this morning. Let me tell you two things. First of all, you're in really, really, really good company. And next, know that God is preparing you for a greater glory you cannot see right now. God has not left you. He has not abandoned you. He is with you for those of you who are in Christ. You can imagine. Imagine the naysayers that come up because it's really easy to sideline coach, is it not? Isn't that really easy? You know all the naysayers come out when something wrong goes? You take a risk, you fail, and here comes all the critics. Everyone know what I'm talking about? You can imagine as he's sitting there and he's got the little baby in his arms crying, where's mom? He's got the little toddler in the crib jumping up and down, not going to sleep. And he's got the oldest Jezreel running around, Legos all over the floor for him to just step on. (laughs) House is a disaster. And he's got his friends, just like Joe's friends, saying, man, God's really left you, man. I told you not to marry this girl. I told you told you. Let's look at chapter 3. Verse 1 and 2 says this, and the Lord said to me, go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethek of barley. You can imagine the scene, can't you? Man, single parents are probably the most amazing people I've ever met. Man, if that's your life, if you're a single parent, you are a single parent, I want to know you are a hero. Man, Michelle was gone for like a few days, and Seth came over, and man, he looked like he hadn't showered in 20, (laughs) and I was like, oh, bro, let me help you. You take care of the kid. I'll take care of the house. I mean, single parents, man, they've got a job, don't they? And so you can imagine the scene. He's got three little kids. And man, everyone's abandoned him. Everyone's left him. This is the bed you made. Now you sleep in it. And he hears the voice of God. Hosea, God, I, I can't. Hosea, God, please. God, I've got too much on my plate right now. Hosea, God, Hosea, here I am, Lord. Go again. You're going to go to that same part of town in which you found her originally. You're going to go to that nasty, disgusting, filthy part of town that even the politicians don't want to talk about. You're going to go to that part of town, Hosea. You're going to marry her. Friends, love transcends the law. Think about it for a moment. According to the law, He could have at best divorced her, been totally justified, or at worst, he could have had her stoned. But God transcends the law because God is love, and here's what he says to her. Here's what he says to Hosea. Go again and love her, and she is loved by another man. So he gets up and he goes. I don't know if he took the kids with him. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. And he goes into that part of town. He starts holding up the picture of his wife saying, have you seen my wife? Have you seen the woman I love? Have you seen this woman? And you can imagine some of the responses, the averting eyes. No, man, I haven't seen her. Oh, bro, I I didn't know she was married to you. Oh, bro, I've seen her, but you don't want anything to do with her. And he comes on to what most scholars agree was probably an auction. And in those times when they'd auction off prostitutes for slavery, they'd most likely be naked. And you can imagine she comes up and she is put onto that stage. And the only way to maintain dignity in a moment like this was her eyes would probably be closed 
And he could go up to the person doing the auction, that man who loved her, the man who owned her because she sold herself into prostitution in order to make a quick buck. And he goes up and he says, excuse me, sir, that's my wife. She's mine. That's my wife. And he says, I don't care who you think you are, buddy, but you're going to have to buy her. No, you don't understand. We're married. You better pay up. And the bidding starts one shekel. Two shekels. And I'll say it jumps up and says, 15 shekels, a homer, and a lethek of barley sold. How much was this? We think, as best we can understand, that this would add up to pretty much 30 pieces of silver, the cost of a common slave. She was sold and bought as a slave. Think about it from Gomer's perspective. As Gomer's sitting here, she sees her husband, knowing he's a pastor, knowing he does not have 30 silver, uh, 30 pieces of silver, that much money to spare. He depleted his whole bank account to buy her, and she is thinking what? Oh my, this is payback. He's going to punish me for leaving him? My life is over. My life is forfeit from this moment on. He's going to give me everything I deserve. I'm his slave. What does he say to her? Look at verse 3. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be with you. Do you see something really important in this verse, verse 3? He is not talking to her like a master talks to a slave. He's talking to her like a husband talks to a wife. Hey, we've been off together, and man, we have got to come, and we've got to do some emotional healing together. He's talking to her like a husband talks to a wife. And so this is a little strange for some of us, because this is exactly how God is talking to us. The Bible uses many different analogies to describe his relationship between him and his people. King, servants, very true. Shepherd, sheep, God loves Psalm 23. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So if you're one of those like ultra freedom people, you've got to realize God will violate your freedom. Amen? All right, good. Um, Again, no, that's hard for our culture to understand. God will violate your freedom to bring about his glory. Husband, children, It's where discipline comes in, that a true parent disciplines their child. Right, parents? and Because they love you. Husband, wife. God's getting at the relationship aspect of his people. So here's what I want us to see this morning, because this is so clear in the text. Hosea's name means salvation. Gomer's name means completion. Because when salvation meets you and I, we are complete. And there was a time 2,000 years ago when God stepped down from his beautiful, wonderful dwelling place in heaven and came to the most nasty and disgusting and horrific place in all of his creation the middle of your life, in the middle of my life. And he said, that is mine, but I've got to pay for it. Because Psalms tells us that everything on this earth belongs to God. And so what we see is God buys back what is already his by saying, that's mine. And what it will cost me will be my own son's life on a Roman cross. So he does it. And my friends, do you notice something about Hosea? You're going to go love a woman in whoredom. And she's going to go back to it. God knew exactly what he was getting into when he saved you. Listen to me, church. He does not regret saving you this morning. God loves you so much. He knows exactly who you are. You're not hiding anything. You might hide it from me. And man, if you're really good, you might hide it from Mark Harris. But let me tell you, 
Let me tell you, you're not hiding it from God. And here's what he does. He says, I paid for that. It is mine and you shall dwell with me. As a husband loves a wife. As a husband cares for a wife. As a husband looks after his wife. You see the story, don't you? Hosea and Gomer is a picture of God and us. It's a picture of you and it's a picture of me. This is your story and my story because you and I both know, if we're really honest, that there was a time when you said, I, I'm out. And man, when you understand the price that it took to buy you back, you're saying, God, I am all yours. There's a few thoughts I, I want to leave you with this morning as we understand the gospel. Number one, if you're in here this morning and you're saying, you know what, that may be good for you, but you don't know what I've done, you don't know where I've been, you don't know who I am, that's good for y'all because you guys got your lives pretty much together, but my life is a wreck. Notice how God describes all of us as Gomer. That God found me, somebody who thought he was good enough for God, and he said, I will pay for that ignorance and arrogance. So he bought me. Next, if you're one of those that the gospel is, let's take a picture, let's move on, let's get to something more than this. Man, know this story and listen to God's voice as he said, so I bought and enter in your name. And if you were in here this morning, your life's just falling apart suffering on suffering on suffering, and you can't take any more, I want to encourage you. Maybe God's using you to tell your story to others. Maybe God's using your life for something far more greater than you can see or imagine right now. And I know it's hard. Next, what I want to know is, do you see God as spouse? And do you see him as somebody who you want to spend every second of every day with? And yes, that's easy for me to say because I'm dating someone super awesome right now. <laughs> but you know it to be true because you married that person because you said, I want to spend the rest of my life with that person. And I never want to spend a second without him. Is that how you see God or is he just, you know, someone you can get stuff from? Next. This is the object of love. This is the understanding of what love is. And so here's the broader application for you and for me this morning. Because God loved us this much, we love this much. What does this mean? Man, there's going to be times where people are going to hurt you. It could be me. But you don't get to walk out on the church. And you don't get to walk out on each other. You say, you know what, I'm walking in this with you. Man, we're going to walk through this together. Because here's what love is. Love is substitutionary. Love is saying, man, I'm going to give some of myself to you, and I will take on some of your stuff on to me. Because that's what Christ did. I'm going to give all of my goodness, my righteousness, everything I have, I'm going to give it to you. And I will take on your messed up, your failures, your sin, all that stuff that no one knows about but I do. I'll take on that disgustingness onto myself. Finally, do you think I messed up? God is going to kill me? Or do you think I messed up? I need God. Is he the true treasure and the joy and love? Or is he just someone you want to take a picture and move on? Man, if he's not your personal Lord and Savior, today is the day. Jump in with us. Because we want to know God and make God known. We want to press into each other's lives. And we want to reach out. Because guess what? Our lives are messy. Amen.
because God stepped into our messiness, so we step into each other's messiness, and we step into your messiness and my messiness and every single messy situation we come in contact with because that's what God did. Let's pray.